What's up my movers and shakers? I'm Dave, world renowned for my hips passing every polygraph test that they ever came up against. And this is of course MS Paints. This week is the start of my new AdMech project and I'm gonna start with the base for the new Archaeopter. <laughs> Sort of new, I'm a little bit behind. This tutorial is essentially also going to cover how to do a generic 40k style base. Leaning more towards the scenic side of things, you know, if you want this to look good on your display shelf, then this is the tutorial for you. If you're new to the hobby, or you've only done things a certain way, or you've never come across this channel before, you may now want to take a moment to reach for your big boy pants, because we are going to get some materials that you may not have come across before. Others common ones you probably have. Up first is aluminum foil, known colloquially outside the Imperium as tinfoil. Certainly, obviously not the most exotic material for my opening gambit there, but easily one of the cheapest and readily available ways to make ground formations. We're going to use this to sculpt our basic topography. I recently did an entire table with this as the main land masses and the table's holding up great. And you want to glue that sucker down with whatever is most convenient. I'm using hot glue because I ain't got time to waste. This stuff is pine bark. I've used it on a lot of videos on the channel so far. Very easy to get hold of. If your neighbor has this stuff in their garden, go and grab yourself a handful. And if they didn't kill you for your trespasses, just go ahead, take it inside, bang it in the oven and dry it out. And if your missus ain't killed you for that, start to glue it onto the base. You can of course just do what I did and buy this stuff pre-dried from most garden centers or online. It's a really cheap alternative to cork bark and also a lot lighter and has more detail than that boy slate. I told you you was gonna need them big boy pants. Next, grab yourself some plaster. Oh, pour it into a container you never plan on using again, ensuring you get some on your table and absolutely ensuring you get it all over your only remaining good pair of jeans, definitely. And I'm using a brand called Herculite Plaster because Herculite is pretty much the strongest casting plaster around. And I wanna ensure my base has no natural predators such as, you know, gravity, or floors, or a combination of the two. Mix this thick with a double C. Thicker than a Mackey's milkshake if you can, much thicker. Apply this guy to the base, delicately at first of course, before running low on camera memory and just throwing it on as fast as possible. Don't worry too much about making a mess on the pine bark, we're absolutely going to deal with this later and clean it up. After 15 minutes, I'm going to test the plaster to see how hard it is, and it's currently way too soft for the effect I'm going for. Just give it another 5 minutes maybe. Once the plaster is chipping rather than flaking, you can get stuck in with a nondescript pointy stick. Start to chip away and be sure to carve in straight lines, only really making sure you don't carve any patterns in there and steering clear from lines that are straight and or parallel to each other. It needs to look au naturel. I use a really soft makeup brush to take any excess away from the surface. This just lets me see more of what I'm doing than anything else. I've left some flat, untouched areas unchipped at the top and I'm going to be treating these to look like mud and sand later on. With the rock carving out of the way, I'm adding some scatter rocks and I'm letting these free flow onto the base before tidying them up a little bit and applying some super glue. Hold on to those clenched anuses because this is trade standard PVA, concentrated. Apply this to the flat areas and areas you would like to look like mud or sand. 
This stuff dries faster than regular craft PVA, depending on how thick you made it. Pop it on a sunny window ledge and you can get it done in about an hour. I'm going to use the base ready pack from Geek Gaming Scenics, also known as Luke's APS. And even though, as the name would imply, this stuff can be applied straight to a base with amazing results, I am going to be painting it. So if lockdown has taught me anything, it's that having better control over what equipment and products and chemicals I have available to me. I didn't know, for example, whether I would be able to get any more of this base ready stuff. So I chose to use neutral colors to paint it, which I can easily get like burnt umber. You can just fucking get burnt umber from absolutely anywhere. So as much as I do like the Luke's APS range, I painted this with a mind that I might not be able to get stuff for the foreseeable future to do the rest of my army, so I use these colours. And in these uncertain times, isopropyl alcohol is pretty expensive, so I've gone with methylated spirit instead, and I'm gonna mix that together with water. And just keep in mind, oil and white spirit go together, water and methylated spirit or isopropyl alcohol go together. We're gonna use this through a spray bottle to pre-wet our base and pre-wetting is always recommended before sealing with PVA. Next, we're using watered down PVA with a pipette. You can use a spray bottle if you wish, but be prepared for that sucker to clog the fuck up. I'm adding a few pieces of scrap now because, well, I forgot to do it earlier, and these can be whatever you have lying around from your bits box. Try to make these look as suited to the environment as you can. I've used some fairly generic, easy to wear bits. This could be Legion, Gaslands, Fallout, could be anything really. Oh, and 40k. And whatever you do, avoid sticking unmodified Space Marine arms onto the base and putting a load of red paint at the arm joint. That never looks good. And I'm going to prime this with whatever can is nearest to me. And because plaster is extremely porous and absorbent, I'm adding a layer of gloss black over the base. I, I do this before priming a final time so that when painting later on, I don't have to do 87 coats of the paint because it keeps soaking in. This can also be done by painting on some 50-50 PVA and water. Our base color of choice is Vallejo Dark Earth, and we're gonna coat everything in this guy. Next, we take a lighter brown, sticking with the greeny gray colors and Xenothal from above, or a 45 degree angle if you're feeling flush. This is to create the illusion of the base getting lighter as we move upwards. Now I sprayed the rocks here, not worrying too much about overlap or color bleed onto the mud. Nature don't paint our rocks to stick out and frankly neither should you. I'm dry brushing the mud with the last of my Terminator stone paint and only attacking the lower areas like the mud and the base of the rocks. For the rocks, I'm using an off-white of some description, either a bathroom tester pot or another cheap craft paint. Painting my scrap in various dark, muted, or desaturated colors. Simple base coats are gonna do fine for this. And I'm gonna introduce a little metallic copper. I'm not worried too much about it distracting because I know it will be covered mostly by the Admec model. You're probably not gonna see it. Like I discussed in my last video, the job of the base is ultimately to put the model over. This don't mean that the base isn't important. In fact, I think the bases are as important as the model. 
you just need to understand the relationship between the two. In this case, I want the base to emphasize the environment that it's in. However, I don't want people to look at the base first and then the model or have difficulty, you know, fighting for where their eye line should go. So no primary colors here and no bright metallics. I'll go with dark browns and reds and some washed out greens. Dry brush on a little metallic around the very edges. We could go further and use a chipping medium to get some worn effects on these, but I wanted this base done in a handful of hours. And just seal this guy up with some matte spray varnish. Gonna move on to pigment powders. Pigment powders allow you to change the core colors you have in a subtle or extreme way, depending on how much you put on. And you can do this without blocking out areas of color entirely. Because they're, well, powders, they have high translucency and are certainly one of the less difficult ways to weather a model with a quick turnaround. Here I'm adding rust to metallic areas and places where the rain would have pulled that rust down into the dirt. The brown and the mud work together quite nice and it can be a surprisingly subtle effect. I can then soften that color down if I want, if the red or orange is too harsh with a burnt sienna powder and also change the ground color for those areas we want to look like mud or clay or whatever else whatever else ground can be made of and as you can see now we've introduced a handful of new colors but without any clear lines or visible transitions perfect the overarching philosophy with making realistic terrain is ultimately to inject a little bit of chaos into the order that you've created. As humans, especially when dealing with little model kits and little scenes, we have a tendency to create patterns when we don't even know that we're doing it. So adding materials that sort of do their own thing, like resins or weathering powders, adds a little bit of mother nature back in there to really just sort of sell the product. At least, I think so anyway. Onto the oil wash. This is a 50-50 mix of burnt umber and ivory black, diluted with a good helping of white spirit. Remember you can do this with just black and brown paint and water if you wish. I like my oil washes thick but chunky, so it'll take some time to make a consistent liquid here. The beauty of oil paints, of course, if you can always reactivate the oil wash effectively within about 48 hours after drying. A Q-tip with some white spirit or just a brush with some white spirit will remove the pigment and leave a nice transition depending on how much white spirit you use. And there we do have it. The base is ready to take my angry metal bug. So this probably took me about four hours to do and you could make it a little bit quicker if you've got a, a window ledge or a radiator to dry that PVA that's your only drying wall in the process. If there's one thing you're going to take away from this I guess it's to have a look at my workflow which is the negate drying times we started with tin foil and hot glue 10 minutes we moved on to plaster 20 minutes the only real thing in there that took time was PVA, and you can bypass that if you're using concentrated PVA. Thank you guys, if you like this tutorial and you want to see more MS friendly or additional needs friendly content, do check out the channel and consider subscribing if you'd kindly. If you really want to help me out, the best way to do that is on Patreon. The entry level perk on the page does give you access to the Ewok MS Family Village. And from there, I can kind of network and connect with painters and makers with additional needs. And I can kind of tailor the channel better to what you guys need. Be sure and return them for my next video, which is where I'm going to be painting up the Angry Metal Bug itself. In absolutely no time at all. No problems. Cheers! I'm out of here.